I want to thank everybody for attending with us today and on today's virtual training event, how to share the gospel clearly and simply. You know, many of us have this desire. In fact, I think all of us have a desire when we place our faith and trust in Christ to be able to share that message with clarity. And we also just want it to be simple. We don't, we don't want to make it confusing. We want to make it simple and easy for someone to understand so they can make a decision for Christ. You're going to learn exactly how to do that today. Veteran evangelist Dr. Larry Moore is with us today. He's going to be sharing exactly how to do that. Ten essential tips, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, President David Sadler is with us as well. Uh, veteran evangelist himself is going to have uh, some great content. Uh, so have pen and paper ready to take some great notes. Uh, so as we get started today, I want to talk to today's agenda. First thing we want to talk about is evangelism and uh, the gospel. What what is uh, evangelism? How do we look at it as a process? And uh, what what ultimately is the gospel? And what part does that play in the fullness of evangelism? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about these ten essential tips for sharing the gospel clearly and simply. Have a concluding word, an encouraging charge, and then have a time of questions and answers. And so with that, I want to turn it over to President David Souther for today's poll question. Yes, and the poll question is, when you have the opportunity to share the gospel, how comfortable are you in knowing what to share? And as everybody on their screen can see, uh, number two, 48% of you said it depends on who I'm talking to. And number three and four actually tied for second place. I'm weak and actually invited into Christ, and I'm very comfortable with sharing my faith. Only 3%. Of those attending today say I'm not comfortable at all. So we have an audience who feels like that they, they, they have some comfortability with sharing the faith, but it looks like they're here, Larry, for the purpose of, of sharing, um, just trying to make it a little bit clearer. Now, I think everybody who feels that way is going to get a lot out of our time together today. And uh, so, David, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, let's talk about evangelism in the gospel. Now, before we cover how to share the gospel, let me lay out some context. Evangelism is a process, and the Bible compares it to the process of farming. You know, in farming, you don't just go outside and start throwing the seed around. There's a process involved, and a couple of items on there. First, we need to cultivate the soil, and we do that in evangelism by getting to know the person, learning what they believe, who they are, and, and at the same time, establishing trust with them. Uh, we also plant seeds. We help someone to think of spiritual things and, and transition conversations to that effect. Uh, we also, at the same time, water the ground, meaning we stay engaged and follow up just in case the conversation ends and uh, there are subsequent conversations. We stay engaged with them, follow up, and keep the relationship going. And then finally, uh, the wonderful part of harvesting where we actually share the gospel and invite a response. Um, again, evangelism is a process, and, and this process can unfold in several ways. These four things we've covered, they can happen in one conversation. You may begin uh, by going from how do you do to would you like to trust Christ, in one conversation with one person. However, it can also happen in a series of conversations you have with one person. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a uh, coworker where you have a long-term relationship with people and you're working through these steps um, as you go. And then, and then finally it can happen through the witness of multiple people to the same person. You know, scripture says, hey, one sows, another reaps. Um, it can happen in a series of people talking to the same person. But the point is evangelism, it is a process. That said, remember that sharing the gospel is the climax of the evangelism process. The gospel addresses, you know, why we have a problem addressing sin. Who is the solution addressing Christ and his person and work? What must I do? And, you know, that's where we point them to faith alone and Christ alone. And if they trust Christ, hey, where do they go from here? Post-evangelism, when we talk about discipleship. I love this, uh, love this paragraph to summarize. Remember, evangelism is a process. 
that culminates with sharing the gospel. When I share the, when I evangelize, I'm participating in evangelism anytime I lead someone one step closer to Jesus. But I haven't fully evangelized until I have shared the gospel. And I think, Larry, you would agree that this paragraph brings it all together. Yes, I love that paragraph there because it is a process. You know, I've told many people that evangelism, biblically defined, is sharing the gospel with the intent of seeing the person trust Christ. So it's information and invitation. And you've not really evangelized them until you've shared the gospel with them. But you cannot look at that as a point. You gotta look at it as a process. Because sometimes, if you said it well, David, you don't have a chance that first time. It's the second time, third time. But you've done all you can that first or second time. And you got to see it as a process. J.I. Packer, in his book, The Evangelism and Sovereignty of God, said you do need a friendship. But some friendships are built in five minutes. Others may take months. And that's the thing to be sensitive to. That sometimes you're someone that God's already done the repairing and he brought you there to actually invite them to trust Christ. Then other times there has to be more of a bridge building. But you got to look at it as a process. You know, you want them to come to the point they've been fully evangelized because they've been formed and they've been invited. But there's a process that leads up to that point. Now, with that in mind, what we ought to do is talk about how to share the gospel clearly and simply. And to do that, what I want to do is make 10 suggestions that I hope will be helpful to you. And obviously, as so many times in a webinar like this, we could spend so much more time on every single one of these if we had them. But obviously, let's pick the most of the moments we have. Okay, number one, understand the three components of a gospel presentation. I really love Charles Spurgeon's statement there. When a man does not make me understand what he means, it's because he himself does not know what he means. And the reason some do not make the gospel clear is they really don't understand the components of what the gospel is. Now, that those components, the three components are, first of all, sin. Now, it's interesting. When the Bible speaks of sin, both in the Old Testament and the New, it had two prominent ideas. The one is we have rebelled against God. We are creatures of rebellion. What he said, don't do, we do. What he said, do, we don't. We are creatures of rebellion. And the second thing is we have come short of his perfect standard. That his goal is not goodness. His goal is perfection. And it doesn't matter how good we've lived, we've come short of that standard. And it's awfully interesting to me, both in the old and the new, that those are the two prominent ideas for sin rebelling against God and coming short of his perfect standard. And that's why any sin has to be punished. In James 2, verse 10, it says, whoever would keep the whole law and yet stumble on one point, he is guilty of all. In other words, when you get up in the morning, you have an unkind thought, you've sinned. That in some way or another, we have come short of his standard. The illustration is often used, and I think it's a good one, that you can tie a boat to shore with a chain, but it doesn't matter if you break one link or five links, that boat is separated from the shore. In the same way, one unkind thought, what have we done? We rebelled against God and we've come short of his perfect standard. And first of all, you have to understand the issue of sin. Then the second component of a gospel presentation is substitution. Now there's something awfully important here. And that is Jesus Christ took our punishment in our place. He did not simply die to show us how to die, putting others first. He died in our place. Had he not died, we would have. The nails that should have been driven through his hands and his our hands and our feet were driven through his. And he died in our place. And he is the only one qualified to be our perfect substitute. Because just as one criminal cannot pay for another criminal's crime, one sinner cannot pay for another sinner. Because he too has sinned. So it took a perfect substitute. And the only one to qualify was Jesus Christ. Even his enemies said of him. They could not find any fault in him. And he was the only one qualified. And the second component is a component of substitution. Then the third component is the issue of faith. We have sin that talks about who we are. Sinners. Substitution. That means the remedy. What he did. Then faith. That means what's God asking us to do. Now, faith means to trust or to place our trust in. That's why often in the New Testament, 
a preposition in is used after believe. For God so the world and gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish. And it brings out the idea that faith should trust in, and we must trust in Christ alone to save us. That is something so important. Salvation is not Christ plus your good works, your kind deeds, your church tenets, your baptism. It is Christ alone that saves. Now on the cross, as we often say here at Van Tell, he did not make the down payment. He made the full payment. As not Christ plus, but Christ period that saves you. Now, in making a clear gospel presentation, you have to get those three components. You have to understand sin so they know who we are, sinners. You have to understand substitution so they know what he did in our place, his remedy. You have to understand faith so they know what God's asking us to do. And you really have to zero in on those three things. Sin, substitution, and faith. And make sure they understand, particularly when it comes to faith, that they understand what you ask them to do because where I find most gospel presentations fail, they're good at telling me I'm a sinner, they're good at telling me Christ died for me to rose, but many times they drop the ball when it comes to explaining what faith is, to trust in Christ alone. And sometimes it takes a while for people to get it. I don't think I'll ever forget the day when Russia first broke open and we were talking to a woman about the gospel, explaining what it is. And we had been talking for about two hours, just could not get her to see him. All of a sudden, she threw her arms in the air and she said, I just got it. You're saying it's a free gift because Christ paid the price. I have to trust in him to save me. Not my goodness, not Christ and my goodness, but in Christ alone. I just got it. It was absolutely exciting to see the light come on and see her beam from ear to ear. And she finally understood it. And if you're going to make the gospel clear, you really have to make sure they understand sin, substitution, and faith. Larry, your story um, just emphasizes the point that each one of these three, and I like to view these three kind of as a three-legged stool. Uh, the stool is supported by all three legs. Um, all three of these are spiritual concepts. And it just brings to mind, you know, uh, what Paul said in Second and First Corinthians chapter two, where he says, "The natural man does not receive the things of God, for these things are spiritually discerned." Uh, we are so dependent, Larry, on the Holy Spirit in order to help communicate these truths. Yes, only the Holy Spirit can make the light come on. Uh, but all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit breaks through and makes them understand those issues. That is so exciting to just see them get it. And but the Holy Spirit has to do it. We are not uh, the thing that enables them to see it is not the human spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. And Larry, along with that, the Holy Spirit may not reveal that to them in your conversation, but he may bring it to mind after the fact that night, a week from then, a year from then, the seeds you plant just because you don't see the plant burst through doesn't mean that God's not at work. Well, makes me when you say that remember something up in washington one time i was speaking for several nights and a person responded the first night and said i want to talk to you tomorrow night because i think i now understand it well he came back the second night and said i want to tell you something i don't think i had the slightest idea last night what you meant it dawned on me tonight now all of a sudden tonight i don't know if it was the way you said it how you said it frankly what the holy spirit saying it that really made it dawn on me what you're talking about. And although he thought he got it the first night, he said, it's tonight I really got it. I now understand that I want to come to Christ. All right, well, let me throw a wrench completely in this because uh, we had a question come in that I think is really uh, relevant, uh, but off topic of what we're doing right now, and that's my most common mistake in evangelism is coming on too strongly and in an insensitive way. How can I avoid this? Well, Two things. First of all, I appreciate the person's integrity. When you recognize you're coming on too strong, then you know what to deal with. And I think the key there is balance. I think by nature, we are victims of extreme. You have the person who spends all his time with the family, acts like nobody else matters. Then you have someone who neglects his family. You have someone who's a spendthrift, doesn't watch his spending, someone who's too much on the stingy side. I think by nature, our depravity makes a victim of extreme. And sometimes coming on too strong 
you simply have to back off and say, God, I want truth, but then help me to have grace with them. And what helps sometimes is to get feedback from people that when you're teachable, which I think this person is saying they are, get feedback from people. Did I come across too strong? Uh, did you understand what I was saying? Do you think I could have said it better? But one thing that plays a big part in that is experience. Because the more experience you have helps you a lot. You wouldn't know you're coming on too strong had it not been for the fact you've been doing it. I commend you for that. At the same time, someone who does not come across strong enough, they learn that by experience. And experience teaches you how to have that balance. I've had to learn in 48 years to back off when I feel somebody is just not ready. They don't get it. They think they do, but they don't. I've had to learn how to back off. But experience is one thing that teaches me that. All right, let's go ahead and jump to number two. Okay, number two. Have one or two verses to explain each point. Now, please notice, we said have one or two. We did not say have 100 or 200 verses to explain each point. Your goal is not to explain the Bible, to explain the plan of salvation. I one time heard a person sharing the gospel, and the more I listened, the more agonized I became, because it just struck me he was trying to impress the person with how many verses of the Bible he had memorized. But the fact of the matter is, that person doesn't need that. They don't need your Bible knowledge memorization. They need one or two verses to explain each point. So, for example, when it comes to sin, it's hard to get find ones any better than Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of of God. Romans 6.23, rage of sin and death. When it comes to substitution, a favorite for many, myself included. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When it comes to faith, favorite of many, again, myself included, is Ephesians 2 to 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Then it says, not of works, a phrase many has never have never seen, lest anyone should boast. Now, having said on one or two verses, please understand that we are saying it is important to quote scripture, because as a remember there says, it's essential to cite scripture when sharing the gospel. Because it's the immeasurable power in the living and active word of God. God has not promised to bless your word. There is no power in the words of David Souther, Barry Moyer, Rock Anderson. God's only promise to bless his word. And that's why, although you only use one or two, you do use scripture. Because God, they have to know this is not what you're saying. This is what God said. Now, a third one. And this is uh, right up there with using scripture but for a different reason use illustrations as you go now the bottom line is very simple when you say something i hear it when you illustrate it i see it so when it comes to sin we miss the mark when trying to obey authorities in our lives we've done the same thing with god no the speed limit sign says 65 no i'm going to drive 75 my parents tell me not to do something i do it they tell me to do something i don't do it a person one time made the comment, I never had a desire to walk on grass until I saw a sign that said, keep off the grass. Then I'm going to walk all over. We are creatures of rebellion. Use the illustration about how we rebel in our own lives. Then substitution. When someone intentionally dies for someone else, they die so the other may live. Jesus had done that for us. Now, substitution illustration, even if the person dies, accidentally for another can be helpful. But the best ones are when someone dies intentionally for another. There have been many unfortunately tragic airline accidents in history, but one that's always stuck with me is one some people don't know happened and one that some people have forgotten. Because it happened back in 1987. Northwest Airline 225, flight number 225, was taken off from Detroit Airport and crashed. 155 killed but there was a four-year-old girl from arizona lived now why did she live because her dear and loving mother as she saw was about to happen got out of her airline seat knelt in front of her four-year-old girl and her body over the that of her girl she sheltered her girl with her own body when that plane crashed every person died except that four-year-old girl.
because a mother intentionally died in her place. Whenever you can bring out an illustration like that, it's so helpful because remember, you're talking to an unbeliever. They hear you say, I died, but they have to hear you say, to say in your place, at your substitute. Then faith. When we get onto a plane, we fully trust the pilot with our lives. That's the kind of trust we have in Jesus. Like you trust a doctor to save your life, a lifeguard to save you from drowning, a pilot to get your destination. I tell people everywhere I go, planes have never got me anywhere, never once in 48 years. It's been a person that's done it, a pilot. God's asking to trust a person. And illustrations help others see what you mean. When you say it, they say, I, I understand it. When you illustrate it, they say, I see it. And that's why it's so important. Spurgeon, when it came to preaching, said about sermons, the sermon is a house. The illustrations are the windows that let in the light. The sermon is a house. The illustrations are the windows that let in the light. In this connection, I would say your presentation is your presentation. The illustrations are the windows that let in the light. And so if you want to let in the light in sin, substitution, and faith, use an illustration as you go along with each one. Very quick question, and it ties back to the question we received about coming on too strong. What if you talk about sin and they, they're just not buying it? You can tell they don't agree with you. They don't agree with scripture about sin, perhaps their own guilt before God. Do you move on to substitution? And if not, how do you handle the conversation then? That's a great question. Uh, before people can get saved, they got to recognize they're lost. Otherwise, they'll never see their need. And I might summarize substitution and faith, but frankly, that's all I do summarize it because they're not ready for that. I have to spend time telling them until you see yourself as a sinner, you will never understand substitution and faith the way you have to because you first have to start there. And one time I was talking to a man, I remember sitting on the sofa with him and he just would not say it. I said, I want you to really understand substitution. I want you to understand faith. I really summarize it, David. Just to summarize, but I said it's not what she's talking because I don't think you see yourself as a sinner, you see yourself as better than most people. Well, much to my surprise, thanks to the Holy Spirit, after a while, he got tears in his eyes, and you don't have tears in your eyes, but that's how much he got. He said, I see what you mean, it's hard to say I'm a sinner. I said, You can't say I'm a sinner, deserving of hell, just like any murderer out there, any thief, then you cannot come to Christ because you have to see yourself as a sinner. So you just have to hold up there. And we also just had a comment come in that, that uh, says our culture does not like to even use the word sin. And I think that's true for people in the church as well when they're trying to explain the gospel. It's so uncomfortable even using that word. Yes, and sometimes use the word rebellion. We have broken God's commandments law. But I don't shy away from sin as much as some do. Now, I do use other words, but the reason I don't shy away from it much as some do, because if they can't say, I am a sinner, then they can't come to Christ. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, because sometimes you can talk about rebellion and separation from God, and then lead them to the Bible calls this sin. Because yeah. they may have their own misunderstanding about what sin is. Yeah. I mean, this is what Christians think sin is, and when you explain to them, then they actually see their problem, and then you say, oh, the Bible actually calls that sin. So hopefully that's helpful to the person that made that comment. Yeah, good comment. Now, number four, be aware of three essentials that enhance clarity and understanding. Now, the three essentials will be very helpful to you. They are clarity, patience, interaction. Let me talk about the three. Clarity and presentation. Are you easy to follow? Now, try to really be honest. All of us want to say yes. But is that really true? Try, try to put yourself in their shoes. Would I have any difficulty following you as you go through your presentation then patience as you share are you going too fast the tendency is not to go too slow the tendency is to go too fast a person who one time ministered on a mission field said there are three essentials to being effective in this field they said what are they he said first is patience second is patience third is patience it takes patience because as David said earlier, they don't always see it the first time, the second time, the third time. Uh, one time a person came up to me at an evangelistic meeting, I forget now, somewhere in the Midwest, I remember that, but I forget exactly where. He said, I heard it, 
I heard it, I heard it, but tonight I heard it. And all of a sudden it broke through, but it took patience. Then the third thing I could talk all day about if we had the time, interaction. If you take interaction out of evangelism, you have absolutely killed it. Because you need interactions you perceive. Are you asking questions, feedback? Do you understand what I've just said? Let me give it back to you. If I asked you, how do you know we're sinners? What would you tell me? If I asked you, why Christ have to die for me? What would you tell me? I have him give it back to me. And uh, I keep asking questions as I go because I want to make sure not simply are they hearing me. I want to be sure they're with me. And interaction is so important. And that's why so many times where gospel presentation fail, it's just, in essence, the person doing a good job of talking, but they're not doing a good job of listening and getting interaction. And that interaction is absolutely critical to knowing if they're following what you're saying. Now, a fifth one, something we emphasize a lot here at Van Tau, and for good reasons. You have to have a method that clearly explains the three things, sin, substitution, and faith. Most people consist of evangelism have a basic message they use to present the gospel. Now, you come out of it differently, you come out of it differently, you change your illustrations, but you have a basic method to share the gospel. One person said to me one time, I really don't have one. I do it different every time. I said, okay, suppose I'm lost, lead me to Christ. Well, he told me how I did. I said, now, do you emphasize this each time? He said, yes, I do. I said, what about this? Do you emphasize this each time? He said, yes, I do. I said, you do have a method. You're changing some parts of it, where you come into it, out of it. He said, well, you're right. I've not met anyone that's consistent. I really emphasize consistent. That does not have a basic method. And that method encourages three things. Clarity, confidence, and consistency. The people have a method. They have, they have clarity, they have confidence, and they are consistent. They actually want to do it. They don't go out with, I have to do it. They go out with, I want to do it. And for that reason, some consider Van Tel Bad News Good News. That's my favorite, one I use the most. Some love our cross talk. Cross talk is very popular with people. And then some love, like the church I just came back from yesterday, they love John 3.16. We've developed John 3.16 in the gospel presentation. God cannot love you a morning love you because God so loved the world. God cannot give you a morning to give you because he gave his only son. God cannot make any separate made it. Whoever believes in him. And people love John 3.16. He's taught his whole church to you, John 3.16. He and I even went out for dinner. And this shows, first of all, the approachability of people. He talked to the waitress and he said, you know, if you're looking for a church home, and she said she was, I'd love to have you come visit us there in McKinney, Texas. And he said, we spend time talking about three things God cannot do. He went through those three things with that woman. And she was so receptive and open. And people sometimes uh, use that. But the point is, have a method. It doesn't matter which one you use. You've got to have a method. You know, I just want to reinforce here, Larry, that when we when we recommend having a method, we're not saying you need to memorize a manuscript or memorize the script. We need to have a roadmap, though, that includes those three elements of the gospel. Yes, a roadmap is a good word because it includes sin, substitution, and faith. But by no means memorizing. Uh, I, I tell people I've a master not memorized. That's the difference. Okay, now number six, be sensitive. Sensitivity is so important to evangelism, but do not get sidetracked. If they ask a question that's not crucial to the discussion, first of all, commend them for the question. Curiosity. I love saying that you ask good questions. Offer talk after this discussion or set a future time. I even say to them, could we write that down? And right after we're done with this, I'll go back and answer that. That way we won't get sidetracked. I don't know one case where they've not said, that'd be fine. Now, be sure to keep your word and go back and answer it because you said you would. It's interesting how many times they say, well, that's really not important anymore. Because when they understand Christ died in their place, a clear presentation of that. It's amazing how many questions that takes care of. Now, People often ask, well, what if they ask a question that you're not sure how to answer? Well, take time to research the topic and the subject and get wise counsel. Then you can have a great, great follow-up discussion. So you can go back to them and say, hey, uh, you asked a question. I did not know the answer. 
that's very honoring to God, help me to say, I don't know. But I looked it up, and here's the answer. Now, now that two things happen. First of all, you're helping that person because you're answering the question they had that was a good question. Secondly, you're now prepared for that same question every time it comes up. And so you've learned how to answer one question. Dawson Trotman, founder of Navigators, were known for a statement. They may catch you once, don't let them catch you twice with the same question. And so if you don't know the answer, you look it up and you're ready next time. But be sensitive, but don't get sidetracked. Got a quick question, really a two-parter here, Larry. First of all, what are some uh, things that you can give our listeners uh, to let them know what questions are crucial versus what questions are not? Secondly, for those questions that are not, what is your method to defer those questions to later? Can you give us some practical advice there? If it's a question, that's a great question there. If it's a question that relates to the central truth of what I'm sharing, I'm going to give an illustration. I take time to answer that. If it doesn't, then I say, could we write it down later? And then I'll write this down and then I'll go back and answer later. Now, for example, one person said, now, Here's where I'm struggling. It seems so cruel of God to let his son die on a cross. How could a loving God allow his son to die? I said, that's a great question. But that's where love comes in. Because suppose I say to you, I love you, here's my house. Well, you don't know. I may have 10 of them. I may say, I love you, here's a million dollars. How do you know I don't have 10 of them? But when I say, I love you, here's my son, that's love. God. God proves his love. He gave his only perfect son, the one who never knew any sin, to die for those who knew nothing but sin. And so if it's your main door, the truth that I'm sharing, I take time right there to answer. Because we can't go on until he gets that settled. But it's not critical to something related to sin, substitution, faith. I say, let's talk about that later. I've had time people would say, hey, let me ask you something. How do you feel about creation? I say, well, that's a good question. Could we answer that? Write that down. I'll go back and answer later. Because I don't want us to get sidetracked what we're talking about. And that's the way you solve that. Now, number seven, give a clear invitation. We'll talk about how to give a clear presentation. Giving a clear presentation means part of it is giving a clear invitation. You're inviting them to faith alone and Christ alone. So the invitation should make it clear, first of all, salvation is based on Christ alone meaning who he is, what he's done for me. I'm concerned how many people there are that are not satisfied with things that satisfies God. He was only satisfied with sudden death, nothing else. Not his sudden death, plus Larry Moore's performance, but sudden death alone. you got to be satisfied with what satisfies God. The only response God will accept is place my faith in Christ alone to save me. And place my faith in Christ is an internal decision of the mind, the will, the heart. Is not tied to external action or work. It's not tied to walking aisle, not tied to saying a prayer, not sign, tied to um, signing a card. There may be ways by which I make it known I want to do that. But trust in Christ is an internal thing, mind, will, and heart. I've often used a story that I love of the seminary president who was talking to his class. And he said, now, when I stand before God, if he says to me, why should I let you in heaven? I'm going to say, because your son died for me. They said to the class, now, I know this will not happen. But God were to say, I'm sorry, that's not enough. All I'm going to do is walk away. That's all I have. That is saving faith. If he can't take me to heaven, I'm going to hell. That's all I have. It's an internal decision. The mind will the heart. Quick question, Larry. Uh, regarding that third point, it doesn't involve an external action. I totally agree with you, and I have encountered many adults who say I'm a Christian because I've raised my hand, because I've walked an aisle. Um, but how do you answer those evangelists or pastors that say you need to do this because the people that Jesus called, he called them publicly. It demands a public response. How do you address that question or that uh, issue? Two things. I was witnessing to someone one time, they said, well, I went for when I was about 15 years old. Well, that's not what I'm asking. So I said to them, if you stood for God, you were to say, why should I let you to heaven? Well, tell him. He said, Christ died for me. And so I said to them, that's right. It's not because you walk forward. That's nothing to do. It's a Christ died for you. 
Now, when people say, well, everyone Christ called, he called publicly. Now, when it comes to discipleship, that's true. You cannot be a secret disciple. If the discipleship will destroy the secrecy, the secrets will destroy the discipleship. But the fact is, John 12, 42 says, they believed on him, but did not confess him because of fear of the Jews. There you have a case where somebody sincerely trusted Christ, but did not confess him because of fear of the Jews. And I don't like it when people say, well, we're called people who call to publicly. When it relates to salvation, when it relates to discipleship, yes. Relates to salvation, no. Because somebody can trust Christ, right? The privacy of the room, inside of a closet, or in your bed, in your office, on a plane, in a car. Now, I keep saying we're talking about giving a clear presentation. Number eight is important in that. Have them give the plan of salvation back to you. Now, I hope you're picking up the fact that when you want to give a clear presentation, it takes time. It's not something you rush through because you're not trying to get, quote, another notch on your belt. Who cares about that? You're trying to get a person to make sure they understand sin, substitution, faith, and are making a sincere decision. I'm not counting how many people lead to Christ, but God doesn't. That's not God's concern. I bring Christ to them. God brings them to Christ. I want them to make a sincere decision, and that takes time. So I say to them, if I said, what do you have to do to get to heaven? What would you say? Then if they don't understand it, I go back over and say the same thing again. Ensure their answer is based on trust in Christ alone. If not, go through the essential elements of the gospel again. Or as I say, if I ask you, before I even pray with someone, I say, I want to ask you something. If I ask you, what must I do to get to heaven? What would you tell me? And if they say anything other than you have to place your faith in Christ, I go back over the whole thing again. And I say to them, let me go back over it again because I want to make sure you understand it. Because, again, I'm interested in a sincere decision. Now, number nine, pray with them as they tell God they're trusting Christ. Pray with them as they tell God they're trusting Christ. Now, what I mean by that is this. Be certain they understand prayer does not save. Christ saves you. You're not saved by praying. You're saved by trusting Christ. That's why there's no sinner prayer in the Bible. Because you're not saved by praying. You're saved by trusting Christ. Prayer is only how they tell God what they've done. And now, people say that if it's not part of salvation, why do it? Here's something I've found in 48 years. It's a mess in their own mind what they've done. I've seen a practical advantage of this. No saving value. I think they're saved before they ever pray. But it's a mess in their own mind what they have done. And the other thing is, by telling God what I've done, they encourage me to now tell you. And they walk away from that conversation knowing they told God, I'm trusting your son. And I found that as a tremendous benefit for an unbeliever. If they so desire, I lead them in prayer, or they can verbalize their salvation to God. And I say to them, do two things. Either you can simply pray and you know, or you, I can lead you in prayer, phrase by phrase. You can pray it out with me. The last person I said that to, he said, in other words, as you pray, I'll repeat your phrase with you. I said, yes. I said, now, please understand. Saying these phrases don't say, save you. He's trusting Christ to save you. But he said, I would love to settle that. I said, well, let me pray. You pray it out with me. So I said, dear God, I'm a sinner. And he said, dear God, I'm a sinner. Nothing to do will get me to heaven. He said, nothing to do will get me to heaven. He went through the whole thing with me, prayed by praise. And when he was done, as I'll say in a minute, I asked him how I knew he was going to heaven. He didn't say because I prayed. He said because I trusted Christ. Now, the final one, number 10, give assurance of salvation. I don't know of any verse that I love better. I've been told that years ago, it was a well-known evangelist by D.L. Moody. I was told that it was his favorite verse, John 5:24. Moses shortly I say to you, he who hears my word, leads in him who sent me, has everlasting life. Shall not come to judgment, but has passed from death into life. I want him to know it's based on fact, not theory. Even if Satan makes him doubt, he goes what God says. I say, did you hear the word? He said, yes, I did. He said, I said, did you believe in him who sent me? Did you trust Christ? Yes, I did. Has everlasting life. Does that mean later or now? He said, well, it has been now. I said, right. It's not something you pick up when you die. You got it right now. Shall not come to judgment. They might not have shot. Who said shall not? 
I said, would God ever lie? No. So he's saying, I promise you, never come to it. But has passed. That means shall pass or will pass. Or has passed. He says, has passed. I said, it's already happened. You have passed. The death is real death. So life is real life. I encourage you to memorize that verse within 24 hours. And then I do other things, interact, to give it yours. I say, if you stood before God, he would ask you, why should I get heaven? Would you tell He said, well, I tell my trust in Christ. I said, where do you go if you died one year from now? He said, heaven. I said, what about five years now? He said, heaven. What about 10 years now? He said, heaven. Well, 50 years from now, one person said, I'll probably be there. <laughs> I said, that's right. You and I probably both will be. But I said, let me ask you something. Suppose tomorrow you got really angry at somebody. I mean, you got the angry you've ever been. Blood pressure went up. You died of a heart attack. Where'd you go? He said, heaven. I said, that's right. Because it's based on what Christ did for you, not what you've done through Christ. I interact with him in that way about it. Even later, for example, I was discipling a man I led to Christ some time ago, just a couple weeks ago. But he came to Christ several months ago. I said, let me ask again now. If you stood for a guy, I would ask you, why should I dinner? What you tell him? He said, I would tell him Christ died for me. And so I interact with him about to make sure that he understands it. Quick question, Larry. What's the what's a clear and simple way to explain to someone that Christ's death uh, does not only apply to past sins, but to future sins? Uh, that Great question. That when Christ died on the cross, I explained, he did not die for simply sin. He died for sins. Sins means those in the past, those in the present, and those in the future. That when Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He said, I've done everything I necessary to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. The wrath of God is against sins in the past, it's also against sins in the future. But when he satisfied the wrath of God, he turned God's anger away from me because that anger was poured out on his son. And he crucified him where he should have crucified us. And I now have a relationship with God. That relationship cannot be changed because God did not take back his decision to accept me. And therefore, I'm forever his. Because I'm forever his, God wants me to confess sin. And it, if I don't, it'll hinder my relationship, but it won't change my salvation. I often have found very helpful to use the illustration of children. My son is my son. It will always be my son. But suppose he wrongs me, says something very ill against me. Does that no longer, that means no longer my son? No, he'll always be my son. But if he doesn't deal with it, it'll affect our closeness. I tell him, your sin, Christ dealt with, past, present, future. But if you don't deal with it, it will affect your closeness. All right, excellent, excellent, Larry. Uh, we've had 10 points here that we've shared, but will you just land this plane and let our listeners know one key thought to take away from this that summarizes it all? If I would say the main point, I wish the listeners would leave it. A pure presentation gospel results when what is clear in your mind is clear in theirs. That if it's not clear in your mind, you cannot make it clear in theirs. And the people, when I hear them present the gospel, the ones that do it well, do it well because they have it clear in their mind, they can then make it clear in the mind of somebody else. Again, going back to Spurgeon's statement, when a man does not make them understand what he means, it's because he does not himself understand what he means. And if you're clear on sin, substitution, and faith, then you can make it clear in their mind because it's already clear in yours. All right, good words, Larry, as always. Uh, and now is the time for Q and A. If you haven't already, uh, please use that questions icon to ask a question uh, about the content today, or if you have comments you'd like to make, if you'd like to, you'd like us to discuss a little bit, please put that in there as well. And Larry, we have our first question that that came in, and it's regarding um, the prayer. And it's it's uh, the question is. Uh, so if we pray with them, do we pray with them the clear understanding that this is not the sinner's prayer? And so maybe you can help put some clarity on that. Uh, I don't say to them, now when I teach evangelism, I, t I tell people, often people say, you want to be saved? Say the sinner's prayer. There's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. You're not saved by praying. You're saved by trusting Christ. Now, when I'm actually dealing with a lost person, I don't explain all that to them. 
all I simply say to me is now, if you want to trust Christ, while we pray right now, you tell God what you're doing. They usually always are very receptive to that. But then I say, now, I need to explain something. Saying this prayer is not saving you. It's trusting Christ to save you. But right now, you want to trust Christ. This is how you can tell God that. Right now, I know it's forever settled in your mind. Because you tell God, I'm trusting your son or no. But saying the prayer doesn't save. And that's why, if you've really made it clear, at the end when you say, if you stood for God, he would ask you, why should I let you have what you tell? They don't say because I prayed. I don't know if I've ever had them say that. They say because I trust Christ. Okay. We have another question in here. It says, uh, I feel like I can share the gospel clearly, but my struggle is turning the conversation to the gospel. Are there any quick tips that you have? Um, the, may summarize often and go from the sector the spiritual to gospel. When I mean to go to the sector, I love to talk about their family job background. Those are three areas to talk about, family job background. They know a whole lot more than you do. Then go to something spiritual. They One guy one time said, uh, my wife and I go to a church and message church and I had to get up to the hardware store right behind the church. And so I said to him later, hey, you mentioned a moment ago you go to church. Uh, I think you're interested in spiritual things. You look for something spiritual. Sometimes something so simple as, boy, I'll say a word of prayer for you, is all it takes. Because I've had him say, I could really use that. I say, no, I really mean it. I believe in prayer. Are you interested in spiritual things? When I talk about family job background, I'm looking for some way, something spiritual. They may bring up, I talked to a woman one time that liked to train Dobermans. I said, why do you like to train Dobermans? You already have it out. She said, you know why? It's all in the outdoors. I love the outdoors. I said, I can sure understand that because, frankly, the outdoors brought me to a big part of my understanding of who God is. And she said, yeah, you can't go anywhere without seeing God, can you? That's all it took. And what you have to do is don't lock yourself in. God gave you a terrific mind. Just be open. Talk about family job background. Find anywhere to connect. Now, remember, this is all about what God says something spiritual is doing. He said, Lo, I'm with you always. Bring it alone. So, the same time I'm talking to that person, I'm whispering to God, God, help me know how to turn this conversation. And you can talk to the person and talk to God at the same time because God hears the whispers of the heart. And, Brock, in addition to what Larry just said, I think it's important for our listeners to know we have other webinars on our website where we've covered this uh, topic. Uh, in full. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, anybody listening, if you go to evangel.org and, and go to uh, their little tab at the top called Start Now, and you go over that, you see a tab called Virtual Events. It uh, has all of our webinar recordings there. Um, about 15 of them uh, cover lots of topics, and uh, a lot of people's questions are answered there. Okay, another question we have, Larry, is do you talk about uh, repentance? There are times uh, I talk about the word repentance. I'm really concerned that people understand repentance means to change your mind. That would keep you from trusting Christ and trust him to save you. So when you come to God as a sinner, recognize Christ died for you and trust in him alone. Faith and repentance have taken place. Now, the reason is important how you define them. Some people think repentance is meaning changing your life. God's not saying change your life and come to me. Regeneration has preceded reformation. God saying, come to me, I'll get your life cleaned up. And so it means you change your mind while I was keeping you trust in Christ, trust in Savior. That's the Apostle John used the word believe 98 times. Never once says repent. Because when you believe in the biblical sense of the word, you have repent. It is essential to salvation. But it means you change your mind about whatever keeps you from trusting Christ. Your good works, your wrong view of Christ, the fact that you're a sinner, and trust him alone to save you. And so when you trust Christ, those faith repents have taken place. All right, kind of a longer question here, so bear with me. But uh, it says, how do you explain the difference between the work of faith and the work of prayer? If they say you can't be saved by the work of prayer, but say faith is work as, as well a type of thing? Not sure if that's the question. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, 
I have to ask questions. Is not faith a work? Yes or no? Faith is a belief. It's trusting someone to save you. And that's not a work. And the clear distinction is Ephesians 2 and 9. For by grace we saved through faith that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works. And it clearly makes it, makes it clear that faith is not a work. Faith is trusting Christ. And works are what results from faith as I try to live a life that's already to God. And I, I'm thinking of the verse, I believe it's in John 6, where Jesus says, this is the work that you need to do, believe in the one he sent. I'm paraphrasing that verse, but I believe there's a verse actually in, in, in John 6, where Jesus clearly defines the one thing, and that's that's faith alone in him. Yes. Um, uh, and, this is the will of, and this is the will of him who sent me. Yes. That everyone who sees his son and believes in him may have everlasting life. I will raise him up the last day. I tell people, you want to do the will of God in your life? The will of God is to believe on his son. And clearly makes, makes it clear it's not a work. All right. Another question here, Larry, is I use the May I Ask You a Question track. Uh, should I give them a copy and read it together, or do I read it to them? Sometimes very intelligent people, I believe, it might be too basic for them. Uh, what I like to do when I go through with someone and I love to use the track because if they come to Christ they don't leave the track with them that's what's helpful when I go through with them all I love to do is read everything else but I him read the verses for all have sinned you know look at that verse in back go ahead and read if you want to and I have him read the verses I read everything else now after medication I read everything yes but usually I have him read the verses now, one reason that's helpful, we talk about interaction. Interaction even involves sometimes having them read part of it and you read part of it. But I have personally found helpful to have them read part of it. And so they find out where it's coming from. And I'll say to them, go ahead and read that verse. So he reads it. For all sin and fall short of the word of God. Okay. Excellent. And we have another question that came in. It says, uh, if someone says yes uh, to the presentation of the gospel, what do I do after that? If someone said yes, in other words, is there anything to keep you from trusting Christ right now? They say no. Would you like to tell God right now you're trusting Christ? They say yes. That's when I say, why don't we pray right now? I was asked that just yesterday back in a seminar talk. If, why don't we pray right now and you tell God you're trusting your son? Now, that's when I say, now saying a prayer doesn't save you, trusting Christ is saved. But they say yes, I want to come Christ. Um, then that's when I pray with them as they tell God to trust in Christ. What's amusing about that is I had a person one time said, you know, he asked, in fact, it was a woman. She asked her sister, would you like to pray right now? Tell God to trust in Christ. And the sister said, yes. So the woman said, so we sat there and stared at each other. And she said, I was not expecting that. <laughs> and sometimes I expect that. And you all go in with expectancy. They're going to want to. And that's when you tell them let's pray together you tell God you trust in Christ I don't think we have time for one or two more questions one more came in it says the person says they don't believe the Bible uh, how do I share God's word with them great question if they say I don't believe the Bible Christianity does not stand or fall in the Bible now, I think the Bible is without error with the, uh, in the word of God but Christianity does not stand or fall in the Bible you lay the Bible aside you still got to deal with Christ and sometimes they say, well, it's all in the Bible. No, the empty tomb is one of the most proven facts of history. If I tell them the issue is bigger than the Bible, I take the Bible in front of us, I lay it to the side. I say, lay the Bible aside, you still got to deal with Christ. Because it stands or falls in the empty tomb. I want to challenge you to prove the empty tomb. I often use the book like Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison or Josh McDowell's work uh, or others, uh, Lee Strobel. I use his works, but they have to realize it's based on MP2. All right, and uh, that's all the time we're going to have for questions today. So I see some other ones coming in, and uh, we'll do our best to, to get you the email uh, to, to answer those. Uh, but uh, that will wrap up questions uh, for today. We want to remind, uh, first of all, we just want to thank everybody for attending, and we want to uh, just remind everybody to uh, look up for upcoming webinars uh, that are coming soon. September and October are already planned. Uh, we have invites uh, going out to those uh, very quickly. 
And so be looking for that. Uh, and so be looking for invites to those. And with that, we just want to uh, invite everybody to, to go to evantel.org and to look at all the resources. We have webinars, we have blogs, we have videos. Uh, we have countless resources there to help you share your faith more effectively, with confidence, clarity, kindness. And we ask you to go there and check it out. Uh, these webinars, these virtual trainings, everything we do is made possible when uh, people like you that are passionate about Evangel, passionate about the gospel, support the ministry. If you have any desire to do that, uh, head over to evangel.org slash support and, and just support us any way you can. Every donation matters, every donation helps. And it just helps us uh, further the gospel and further the kingdom of God. So thank you for attending today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the week.